Can you hear me in the house? Yeah. Yes? Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I imagine people are going <laughs> to just continue to just file in, and we will welcome them with glee and gladness as they come. But I think we should just take every moment afforded to us to pursue the presence of God together tonight. I'm so excited um, that you are all here. Um, so let's stand together. I'm going to just open in prayer, and then we're just going to get the party started. <laughs> so excited. Oh, Holy Spirit, we're so excited to be with you. We invite you to come. We thank you, actually, because two or three and more are gathered in your name. Here you are. And Jesus, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to each one of us in greater measure. Lord, that as we worship you in spirit and in truth, as we worship you with our body, soul, and spirit, that you would just come in power and be enthroned on our praise. We want to exalt you in this house together tonight. We thank you for this weekend and for the unity that we've enjoyed, God, and I just am excited to see what you're going to continue to do tonight as we pursue breakthroughs and all of the good things that you have in store for us. We say yes to all of it. Thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start with no one. That's that, that peppy tune that we did. So I'll try not to start it too fast. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
nobody like you. Nobody like you. No one nowhere. No one nowhere. All right, the drums and the voices. Ready? Lover of my soul. Lover of my soul. into your courts with praise. Lord, we are going to continue to exalt your worthy, worthy name and take us deeper, take us further into the courts of the Lord. We want to get to that most holy place together tonight. We're in pursuit of you, Jesus. Most worthy, worthy of praise, exalted above all things, my God, you are my God. Your splendor and majesty, your wonder fills everything, my God, you are my God, and holy is the Lord, and holy is the Lord Almighty, seated on the throne, he's seated on the throne of glory, high and lifted up, your presence fills the temple when we worship you. Oh, we worship you. Sing most worthy. Most worthy, worthy of praise, exalted above all things. My God, you are my God. Your splendor. to the king the heaven 
and creation points to the King. The heavens can't help but sing to you, to you, our God. Because holy is the Lord, and holy is the Lord Almighty. Yeah. 
rush past this holy moment, you know, it's this is our opportunity to just lean in to that holy place, whatever it looks like. Oftentimes, once I get there, it's just like cry city, you know, and other times it's just like, whoa, here I go, you know, I just have to bow down.
radiant like Moses when he came down from meeting with you on Mount Sinai. God, would people notice our complexion and be like, hey, you look great today, and we can be like, it's Jesus. Like, God, would you change our appearance and our countenance to look more like you, God? Come and behold him. Is 
privilege this evening just to gaze upon your beauty and express our love, our adoration, our worship. Mm, this evening has been just um, such a time of just honest, simple awe and worship of the King. Yeah. And then, as Sophia said, he just responds, he just um, shines his radiance down upon us and he changes us. Every time we're in his presence, every time we commune with him, we're different. We're more like him after. Mm. Wow. So let's be a people who let our hunger for God have the loudest voice that our hunger for God is what motivates us and drives us and, and, and even informs the biggest voice that informs our decisions. We want to just keep being a people who are in awe of you, a holy fear of the Lord, and just a, a, a love drawn to the lap of a good, good father. May we have both. May we know you completely in all the, all the facets of who you are. Oh, Lord. Mm, thank you, God. Yeah, we just worship you tonight. We glorify you. Thank you for your presence among us. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Wow. Well, welcome <laughs> to this service tonight. Um, I'm Pastor Marilee. My husband and I are the uh, pastors here. We're so excited that you're here. And we're so excited to have this team uh, coming to share. And so we actually just want to get the mic right off to them and um, hear what the Lord would share through them. So would you guys just come? Let's just welcome them. Yeah, a little over eight years ago, they, they were very significant leaders in this house. A little over eight years ago, they were called 
um, to do something else for a while, but we've maintained a close relationship, and it's always a joy when they come back. And so this is Sarah and Seth Gerber. <laughs> so good to be with you guys again. Um, man, the presence of God. Oh, let's just stay in this there for place. a second. I know, it's wonderful. <laughs> and I just want to thank the worship team. Worship you guys team. did so well hosting the presence with your worship. Thank you so much. Wow. Thanks, thank, you, Holy Spirit. thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for how you come and you rest on us and you bring who you are. And we're filled with a substance that comes only from you. We can't get it anywhere else. And um, we just thank you that you've made us to be like sponges <laughs> and we can soak you in. We soak you in and who you are. <clears throat> it just comes into our souls, our bodies and our spirits. And we're we're different because of you, God. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. Just kept seeing this picture of, uh, you know, when a baby, you're holding a baby and you smile at the baby and look at the baby and the baby like recognizes what's happening, but then they turn away because it's so much. This is actually scientifically true. The, the baby can't take the amount of attention and love and focus that somebody holding them, a, a loving caregiver would hold them. And so they have to turn away but then they turn back and gaze again and, and again, receive the joy and the excitement and the focus. And I just, I felt like that was us tonight. It was like, oh wow, I'm just in awe of you. It's almost overwhelming, like almost too much. And then I just got to take a second, but I'm just going to look back again. I just want more of that. I want to, uh, it's like we be, we become what we behold. We actually become what we behold, what we look at. Man, I'm just undone right now. Oh, yeah. So God, give us that hunger to keep turning back to you as our only source, God. We have to, we have to have you as our only source, Father. We have to have you as our only source. Give us that hunger. That's a prayer that actually Sarah and I prayed when we didn't feel hungry we would pray, God, give us hunger. Because <laughs> he's the one that does, he's the one even that draws us to him. He's actually the one that draws us to him. So I'm like, okay, I don't feel it. At some level, I don't care what I feel. I'm going to pursue anyway, because I'm not led by my feelings. I'm led by his truth and his word. But there is something about even asking him, hey, help me, <laughs> help me. Help me to love you and pursue you. Yeah, I remember um, not wanting to read my Bible or you spend didn't time with God. You want to read your Bible? Yeah, it's true. Whoa. And, um, <sighs> and I just thought, I need God to help me want to read my Bible. I need God to help me want to spend time with him. And so we just spent like lots of the first years of our marriage just every night before bed. God, make us hungry for you. God, make us hungry for you. And that prayer, we stopped praying it because we were living it. <laughs> We, we just started living it and we, it's like, it feels like the snowball effect. It's like when it, you're going on the hill and it increases and increases, it just has grown and grown and grown and grown. And we're hungry now. And I love like actually reading my Bible. It's like the Lord answered my prayer. I have this little habit. I read it at night before bed and in the morning when I wake up. Um, as a habit, because I want to form a healthy habit. You know how easy it is to pick up your phone first thing in the morning. And, and then it's like the thing that you wish you, you sat down earlier, but before you went to bed, but you were on it longer than you wanted to be. And now you're going to get a shorter night's sleep. Is that anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> so I have like disciplined myself. I am going to put my phone away. I'm going to read my Bible. That's the last thing I'm going to do before I go to bed. And it's the first thing I'm going to do when I wake up. And I'm not always perfect at it, but man, that habit, just letting that like become the norm, but that wouldn't have happened unless I would have prayed that prayer years ago. God, make me hungry for you. Make me hungry for you. Make me hungry. And it's like, just continue to increase in our lives. Let's do it right now. Yeah. Everyone close your eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just repeat after me, Jesus, I can't love you without you helping me to love you. 
I can't hunger for you without you giving me hunger. I today ask you for an impartation of hunger, of hunger for you, of hunger for your word, of hunger for life in you. And I thank you that you are faithful to answer my prayer. Amen. Yes, God, Amen. that we would be more Oof. addicted to you than to our phones. Hey. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Way awesome. more addicted to God. Thank you, God. Can't All get right. Enough. Can't get enough. Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> so um, we wanted to talk to you guys tonight about, and it's something that God laid on our hearts as we were praying for this church. And um, <clears throat> we just felt like the Lord wanted to um, bring healing and health into families. And we know that revival is sustained and housed and maintained through healthy families. And we know this because the Trinity itself is a family. The Father, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, and the Son are a family. And then they created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve had children, and they were a family to house the presence of God, to relate with God and in intimate connection and love. And that's what God created us for. And so, <laughs> um, <clears throat> in past, I'm I was going to start <laughs> and she started. <laughs> I just went more than I realized. It. <laughs> Do you want it's great. Pass the, baton. Pass the baton. All right. I got it. I got it. Uh, yeah, I think like one of the things that we felt, we were actually praying. This is our team. Can Elijah and Emily, can you wave at everyone? So these guys, they've been awesome. They're actually, we were all at, at BSSM together. We were pastors in Reading at Bethel Church. And, and we, we did the school eight years ago and then went on staff. We were on staff for five years there. And part of being on staff is you take interns on your team that help you to do, and then you mentor them. And so then we were moving from Reading, from Bethel, over to South Carolina, to Somerville, South Carolina, where New Day, South Carolina is. So the, the connected church to this church is. And we still wanted to take interns. But we knew only crazy people would actually come and leave this amazing community in Reading and come all the way across the country. And so there's the crazy ones. <laughs> They're the awesome ones. So. And we had one more named Guy. You probably saw him, and he had to take off. Um, uh, he just left this morning, but he was with us, and he's amazing too. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking, I was just thinking about, uh, we were praying as a team, actually. All of us were praying as a team at, about this, like Sarah said. And this family idea came up, that revival comes out of family, that healthy relationships and healthy family is actually uh, how God wants to move on this earth. Because there's, there's an attack on family, isn't there? Huge attack on family. And so, and it's been so cool. Every session has felt like, family. It's felt like this great connectedness, this unity. And so we're just going to finish it out tonight. And, and I think that, um, revival comes, um, and many, many times in revival history, what breaks that thing from happening is when relationships get broken down. It's actually relationships that get broken down, selfishness, whatever that actually can stop the move of God. And we just want to get out of the way for God to move. Like we just want to have healthy relationships, healthy friendships, healthy church family. And so we're going to go back to the beginning. All right. We're going to go back to the very beginning in the, in the, in the, in the, the actual beginning, <laughs> not the beginning of your life or my life, but the beginning of the world, the beginning of humans. That's right. <laughs> so Adam has been created. Eve has now been created Adam's like, wow, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. I knew that was coming. I, I, ju I didn't stop on it. I didn't like make it. I just kind of, okay. It's the, it's, it's the best preacher joke that there is. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife 
and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So at the very beginning, God sets the precedent that there's no shame. There's ultimate vulnerability. They're naked, right? There's ultimate intimacy. There's ultimate freedom. There's ultimate oneness. What would that be like? Like no fear, no fear in relationship, no sin. You're, you're fully known for who you are and you fully know the other person. And there's perfect love and unity in that place. It's kind of hard for our minds to actually like connect with that idea that this perfect, beautiful relationship could actually be happening. And I think it's what God wants in our relationships is this intimacy. He wants that vulnerability. He's, he's inviting us to have a connection with each other, with him that actually is being completely known and knowing completely. Uh, Danny Silk says being known and accept it, This is what intimacy is being known and accepted and completely knowing and accepting in return. It's the most satisfying experience that we can have as humans. Yeah, I just think, I just, I just try to imagine what that must have been like. God provided this incredible garden that had every provision perfect in every way. Their connection with God was perfect. They had a perfect understanding and connection with God and then each other. Can you even imagine what that must have been like? I just sit there and I think, like, how, how was that? I mean... We don't know what sinless life looks like. We don't know that thing because we've always had some breakdown of relationship. We've always had some walls or some thing that's kind of blocked that thing that Adam and Eve experienced. And, and that is just so beautiful that God created us for that. That's what he created us for. And his goodness just abounds in, in all of that. You can see it from the beginning. So in Genesis 3, 7, this is what happened. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is the moment we're all like, dang it, Eve and Adam, why? <laughs> so then the eyes of both of them were opened. This is after they took of the fruit. We won't go through all those details. But then the eyes of them are open. So this is the sin happened. And I'm sure there's a lot to say about that part. I think one of the interesting things was that Lucifer had fallen because he wanted to be like God and wanted to kind of be above God. And then he tempts Adam and Eve with, you can be like God. There was a pride there. And then he says the thing that he wanted and, and kind of slips in some ideas that make them think that this is a great idea. They were deceived. And there was, a, I think, a sense of pride in that. I want to be like God. And it, and it kind of came in and got them to try this kind of thing that then God had told them led to death. There's a lot there that we could go into, but um, we're going to not go into all the details of that tonight. But... Um, so then the eyes of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they, they tried to cover things up and they heard God walking and um, they, they heard his voice. They, they knew he was coming. And so they, they were afraid. They, they knew that they were ashamed. They were afraid and they hid and they, you know, I don't know, went behind a bush or something. <laughs> and... God asks, you know, where are you, Adam? And, and then they said, you know, I was afraid and I hid. And I, because I knew I was naked, I had shame. And God said, who told you you were naked? And, you know, have, have you done this thing that I've said not to do? And then Adam said, it was the woman you gave me. That was his response. It was the woman you gave me. And she gave me of the tree. And I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, it was the serpent. Okay, so this is the breakdown of what we have here. 
This is what happened. There was shame for the first time. There was perfect unity. There was perfect oneness, perfect love. And now they've done this thing. And now there's shame for the first time ever. There was shame. They were afraid. And so they hid. And another kind of idea of that is control. They were ashamed. They were afraid. And then they had elements of control. Have you guys heard of the shame, fear, control cycle? Some of you are familiar with that from the years of healing and restoration ministry in this church. Well, the next thing that happened was, so this is the breakdown of relationship. This is what happens in, in humans in this fallen world. This is the breakdown. We have shame. That's the first thing that happens. We're afraid of being found out about our shame. And so we hide. So they covered up. And, and how we do that now is the idea of shame is there's something wrong with me. And so you have a sense of like, oh, there's something really wrong here. And it's like an identity that you kind of, I, you um, kind of agree with or identify with. And then you're afraid that people are going to find out that there's something wrong with you. And so, and I'm saying you, we, you know what I mean? Um, so you're afraid and that fear sends us into trying to do something to hide that. So some people go into shutting down who they are because that's their form of control. If I shut down my personality, if I don't say things, you know, if I just hide, you know, from who I am, then no one will know that there's something wrong with me. Other people, they perform, they work really hard. They actually go into like, da da da, I'm so great. And it's a, a, a form of control that looks kind of like performance and achievement and success. And that hides the shame that they feel. You know, I don't measure up, so I need to do all these things and make it look like, you know, I actually have what it takes. And there's all kinds of different responses. Those are two of the main ones. I know for me in high school, it was the shutting down <laughs> massively. My voice was like, I had no voice at that time. I really relate with this. So then what happens, and this is so true to human nature in this fallen world. So as soon as they're questioned about it, it's like God is like, you know, kind of trying to find out what happened, which God, we all know God knew what happened. <laughs> but he's like wanting to bring them into connection. He's wanting to, because there's some distance now, he wants to come close. And so God is asking like, you know, what's going on? And so the thing that happens is suddenly now Adam, the hiding that is going on, he's got to do something about it, you know? So he's like blaming immediately. So he's like, it was the woman. <laughs> it's like, it was the woman you gave me. It's a double blame moment. <laughs> Adam goes right into double blame. And, and what that does is that makes him a victim. I am is now the, a victim. There's the only two people to blame on the <laughs> exactly. I mean, let's there's not nobody else. Let's not let's just blame <laughs> let's not take personal. <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> you're it's you. it's you and yeah, that woman too. So it's like you want to get off of you the sense that there's something wrong or I did it or whatever. You you want to get that as far away from you can. So you you point, you know, to whoever you think did it or whatever. So so he points like it was the woman you gave me double blame moment. And now he's the victim of even God. So he's now a victim. He didn't own the moment. He didn't say I ate of the fruit because he did eat of the fruit. That was his decision that he made. Eve didn't make him. He took of it and ate. So he's now a victim of Eve. He's a victim of God and he's now blaming. And so here's the saddest part of this is they were one flesh and they had perfect intimacy, connection and closeness, union, unity, and it's perfect. And this moment, it's like, do, 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 do. <laughs> like everything breaks down. It starts with sin. And then, and then this moment of like, it was the woman you gave me is immediately bringing division. It's so sad. Can you imagine that perfect unity? They never experienced brokenness before. And then boom, division. 
you're, you're, you're putting the blame on somebody else, and it has a form of accusation attached to it. Yeah. Oh, can you see it? <laughs> oh, okay. We can't see it. You can look back and see how we can't see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like. You guys are like. So we have shame that leads to fear, fear that leads to control, control in this situation with God asking, he's the victim, he blames, and now there's division in the relationship. So this is the breakdown. There's more to it. And, and obviously, we know that Adam and Eve had children, and then there was two sons, and there was the saddest thing that happened there with envy and jealousy, and then a murder. And so the second generation of this um, kind of breakdown is envy and jealousy, which also brings division. So isn't that sad, guys? When you think about what they had, what we, we had, and then what happened instead. But guess what? Hey. There's hope. You want to know why? Because Jesus died on the cross. Right. Jesus, the father, said, I have a solution. And he sent his son. And when Jesus came, he... He, his whole time on earth, he was talking about his father. He was talking about his father. He kept talking about the goodness of his father. And he demonstrated something that we don't have. He demonstrated perfect submission to the father. What, what my father says I do, and I do it in like manner. You know, I love my father. My father loves me. He, I do what he commands. I mean, he just like kept kind of, even with his words, just setting up like, hey, we have, my father and I have a healthy relationship. <laughs> You can kind of come into that too, you know, and he's really revealing the father, revealing that Trinity love that's so powerful. And he's introducing what's possible again. And then he dies on the cross. He gives up his life. And he, um, when he dies, the veil was torn, which the veil in the temple was a symbol of the kind of disconnection between us and, and the father. And it was because of his blood that the veil was torn and we have access to intimacy with the father again. And we have intimacy with each other again. And so he came to restore all of that. So while it is sad what happened, we have hope and we have the ability to actually live in health. You know, when we say that family and healthy family houses and sustains revival, it really starts with you and me. You know, we can't cause health to just happen all throughout our family. It actually starts with us. That would be and then, controlling. Yeah, that, that would be control. That would be control. <laughs> you, be healthy. You, be healthy. Yeah, it starts with us. We have to be the ones that own our own story, own our own situation, circumstances of our own wounds, and, and then we get healthy. And as we get healthy, it actually spreads and causes health around us. But it has to be an ownership inside of us. Because of the cross. <laughs> it's funny. And in this, in this one back here, you can only see the other side. You can't see the red. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so here's the, here's the redeemed side of things. So instead of having shame, we have honor and we know who we are as sons and daughters, our true identity in Jesus. Instead of fear, we have love. Perfect love casts out fear. So we are filled with love and we no longer have to agree, respond, you know, live in and partner with fear. And then instead of control, there is freedom. Man, when I think about the garden, when I think about how the father put that tree in the garden, he gave them absolute freedom to choose away from him. He did not want love to be a forced or controlled thing. And so he put a choice to choose away from him because that obviously is how you can love people fully. And so there was absolute and total freedom in the garden. And when I think about the moment that Adam and Eve were having that time with a little serpent, 
I'm like, if I was the father, if I was God, I'd be watching. I know the serpent was kind of, you know, wheeling and dealing and working his way over to them. And if I was the father, I might be like, hey, guys, remember what I said about the tree? Remember that? Okay, um, just remember that if a certain, you know, serpent kind of comes around. I don't know, but, you know, there could be a serpent that might come around. Don't eat it. Don't you dare. It would be awful. It would be terrible. You know, like, if I was the father, I would want to do that because it would save everything. But he didn't because there's total freedom. Total freedom. There was no manipulation, no control, no trying to protect the connection, making sure he had total freedom. And I'm telling you, one of the most incredible Uh, most beautiful elements of healthy relationship is freedom. Freedom. If there is freedom, there is a thriving that happens in relationship. And I just want to say, if there isn't freedom, if you feel like you can tell inside of you that in connections with people, you're not acting in in a way that promotes freedom in the connection, then you can go, oh, There must be fear and shame. There must be, because I am not promoting freedom in this relationship. I am doing things or manipulating a certain way, or I'm trying to get things to work out for me, or I'm, you know, saying things at a certain time because I know if I say something, then maybe they'll do what I want them to do. Like, all that stuff is an indicator of other brokenness. And, but here's God, he does it. Jesus does it inside of us. And that simply we can, if we see those things inside of us, we can go, God, help me. I know I'm not acting in freedom, but I just need your help. Would you just help me to be a daughter of freedom, a son of freedom, to have freedom in my relationships? I just paused on freedom, but we're moving on. So instead of being a victim, we can be victorious. Instead of blaming we can take ownership of our own stuff, okay? Instead of division, we have unity, okay? And same with jealousy and be the things I mentioned in the second generation. So important. So this is what we want to just recognize in our lives. And recognition is just the first, it's, and it's a massive step to just going, oh, yeah, I see that inside of myself. So Seth and I live a culture in our marriage. And we've grown in this because we weren't always this way at all. (laughs) In the early years, I'm just saying, we have grown and grown and grown and grown over the years in kind of owning our part. So, yeah. Uh, 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 So (laughs) so we've got this little Check, check, check. There we go. And I just turned it off. That was that was on me. You guys are good? Can we give it up for the tech team? I mean, like, all weekend long, serving back there. You know, the worship team's on the stage. They're in the background. And we just love you guys and bless you. And helping us with our slides. Yes, thank you. Very good. Very good. Um, one, of, yes. one, of the things, one of the things that we've taken is that we when we are in conflict or when we feel fear <laughs> in our relationship or we feel ourselves controlling or we or we become the victim kind of any of these things on the left side your left uh, we've we started doing this we started going what in me is contributing to this issue because how many of us know that 99% of the time it's definitely her like, let's be real. I, I am bothered. I am agitated. I, she is doing that to me. It's totally her fault. It is possible. Stop it. It is so possible. <laughs> Look, I got like a cheering team over here. Everybody's like, not Sarah. No way. Yes, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is our tendency in life, right? Something's wrong. It's, de- it's blame. It's definitely the other person. Mm-hmm. And so what we've started doing as a discipline in our marriage is we've started saying, okay, God, this is, my, this is Seth's version. 
okay, God, I know it's 99% her fault. But if there is one little tiny percent that might maybe be possibly, probably not me, will you just whisper it to me? T talk to her about her 99%. But I guess if you want, you can also just, if there's a little, I'll, I'll deal with my little 1%. I'll deal with the little part of me that's the problem. And if we're humble enough to say, what in me is contributing to this? At least in our experience, God goes, actually, Seth, <laughs> this is more about you than it is about her. See, you are reacting to a situation that you want to put her and blame her for. But actually, that is a gift to you because I'm going to do something in your life. Yeah. I'm actually, this agitation, this frustration, this, bit, this thing that's coming, the fear, maybe the shame, it might be exposing something and putting something, like I feel like I want to hide right now. It's her, she's exposing me. Mm -hmm. God wants to do something in me. Mm -hmm. God wants to do something in me. And so for our marriage, we've just decided when there's conflict, when there's challenge, and this isn't easy. Every time it's not easy. <laughs> Cause what we want to do is blame, shift blame. We want to control. We want to put it on the other person, but God's like, no, no, no. Let me use this situation to actually transform your life and your heart mm -hmm. and what happens in mm -hmm. you. And there, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just want to say like, we're talking marriage, but any, any, place where you are, where there's relationships. So this could be work. This could be church. This could be, um, extended family, you know, just any area where we're in relationship. And when something comes up between you or in, in the connection, and, and if it's something where there's something, any, anything, seriously, there's something inside of you that is getting triggered. We like to kind of liken it to. Can I just say one more oh, thing yeah, before ahead. you do that? Yeah. So, so we asked, wait, 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 that was what I wanted. We always ask the question, what in me is contributing to this? Here's, I just want to give a little scriptural context. Psalm 139. Search me, oh God, know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me. That's an ownership scripture. <laughs> That's i uh, I'm not going to push blame. I'm not going to try to control. I'm going to go, what in me? What in me? Mm -hmm. It's good, isn't it? I know you can feel it. What this does, what this does is it's, it creates a culture of submission to the Holy Spirit. This actually goes, Holy Spirit, you're the great helper in relationships. You're the one that can help me. You're the one uh, we, we pastored for a whole bunch of years and we've had students. I love God, love them. I mean, seriously, I love them, but they've just come at us. Like, you're just like my father, da, 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 like attacking. And we know <laughs> that it's not us that are like their father. Well, it, they, their perception is, but the pain that we're causing them is actually related to their, their pain with their father. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about, uh, learning all of us learning to have submission to the Holy spirit in these areas. Now here, I just want to say one, one thing on the side, some of us lean towards self-criticism. Some of us lean toward like blaming ourselves all the time. And so there's a caveat to this whole thing. We want to take, always take ownership. We always want to take ownership. We always want to say, God, what in me is contributing to this? But if you're a natural, very self-critical person, you can always let, like, totally just go, it's not them, it's always me, I'm the problem. And so what we need is the beautiful power and help and voice of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And we yield to the Holy Spirit and go, we, that, it's that scripture, search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me in my exam. It's like, okay, God, it's what, do what you want to do in me. Yeah. And I would say to that, the, it's always the motivation of the heart, which sometimes we don't even know the motivation of our own heart. It's hard to see that sometimes, but like what Seth is saying, like being self-critical 
is it's coming from like condemnation of self or even self-hatred, um, self-rejection, all that stuff. What we're talking about is a desire for growth. And that has to do with loving yourself well. It's actually about, you know, wanting to grow and be more like Jesus and to not come at yourself in a condemning sort of way, like what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? That's not the point here. The point is, is allowing the situations in your life to give you a roadmap to the healing that you need. It's, it's about actually finding out if with this conflict or this bump in this situation or this, that this thing that makes me feel weird in this situation, it's a roadmap to what's actually going on inside of you where the Lord, it's an invitation for healing. It's an opportunity. So we always say the gift, the people around us are a gift to us, even though if it causes lots of pain, because God is going to use that if we want him to, if we let him, if we're humble, then those situations will actually be a gift to us to be, to be healed, even when they're painful. And so what we liken it to is there's like, say that there's like a wound on my arm. There's like a wound here. And actually this wound has to do with, let's just say like a father wound. And I, you know, when I was a kid, I'm just filling in the blanks. My dad was like abusive or, you know, just maybe verbally or something like that. And that wasn't the case, but let's just say, and, and I have got this wound and it's just like there in a place where, you know, it's vulnerable to, you know, outer things. We all kind of are in relationship and connection with people where in a sense, we're like vulnerable to, um, you know, kind of getting iron sharpening iron, if you will. <laughs> and so I'm married to Seth and yes, you are. we come into, very, ha very happy about this. We, we come into, um, a situation where like he, I'm like, he, yeah, bumps my wound. And what do I respond with? You hurt me. You hurt me. That's what I see. I see that you hurt me. That's Blame. what I feel. You're the one that's causing the pain. Don't be a victim. <laughs> But the truth is, I actually have a wound there. I have a wound there that has not received healing yet. And so what, what Seth in my life is showing me, boom, is that this is an area of opportunity because now I know it's there. And I now can take it to the Lord. Instead of going, you hurt me, I can go, hmm, what is this wound that I'm experiencing pain from, where is this coming from? Pray about it. Ask the Lord, oh, I think this has some connection to do with my, my father. I wonder if it's something to do with that. That's the kind of process you have to kind of work through when you come up against situations. That's why it's a roadmap. The, the, the kind of triggers that come up in our relationships are, are hel helping us identify what's actually going on inside of us. Right. Let me give an illustration for this. I, back in Reading, there was a friend of mine who is also on staff with me. And um, he, I would need to text him about something, you know, having to do with, you know, random stuff. Um, and just texted him, hey, blah, blah, blah. What do you think of this thing? Or, you know, asking a question or whatever. And he wouldn't text me back. Wouldn't text me back. And I'm just like, just text me back. I need to know this information. Like, why aren't you texting me back? So frustrating. Anybody have that kind of situation where you're just like, come on, dude. And so I text him again. You know, what about that thing? Hey, you know, beep, I'm still here. You know, question, you know, the little question thing where you can ask on the, um, <laughs> and, and what's happening is no response, no response, no response, no response. And I'm like, excuse me, like I'm here. And I started feeling this kind of thing of like, man, he doesn't value me. If he valued me, if so-and-so was texting him, he would totally respond to them. But he, you know, th that's maybe what's going on on the deeper level of what's happening in this situation. I'm feeling upset. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, but, but deep down, there's this thing of like, I don't think he values me. I actually, the, I'm tired of this. Like, I wish he valued me. I wish he thought I was more important. There's maybe a little bit of rejection in there, you know? 
And so I just am like, you know what, this is really getting to me and I'm just going to go talk to him because, you know, I don't want my kind of feelings to get in the way of our connection. I want to actually talk to him, which is always a good idea, right? Never a bad thing. So I go to him and I just tell him, you know, hey, so you give him a text me back. I just, you know, I just, it makes, I said, I said, I, and he's like, I know, I know, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I just, it makes me feel, I'm starting to cry. It makes me feel like, you know, value me, <laughs> you know? And he's like, he's like, I know, I'm so sorry. I just want you to know, like, this is an issue for me. I have a hard time texting people back. Like everybody tells me this, you know? And, and he's like, I'm so sorry. This is the thing I want you to know. I value you. I really do value you. And I was like, okay, you know? And, um, but I kind of left and I was like, but I just don't think he does still, you know? <laughs> it was just like my own little internal world thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I walk away from that situation and I was glad I talked to him because I'd rather have like a connection be made than just like distance and distance and distance. Anyway, like weeks later, the Lord, it was one of those moments where the Lord kind of snuck up on me when I was thinking about it. And he said, you know, you never really had to talk to him about it. And I was just like, what? And he said, if you had always felt valued in your life, you, have, you would have never felt that trigger from this situation. You would have thought, I wonder if he's okay. I wonder what's going on. He must be really busy. I wouldn't have taken it personally. I wouldn't have made it be about me. I was now a victim of this guy. I'm, a, I'm now a victim of this guy. Doesn't this like mess with your head? You're like, wait, what? I am now a victim of him, but it's because this is my wound. This is my wound. Him not texting me back was pushing on my wound from my upbringing. There were situations in my life where I felt not valued, especially by people that he kind of represents. And so the Lord was like, yeah, you didn't have to talk to him. This is not about him. This is about you. This was your issue. And I was like, whoa, what? Like, it just took me a while to let that sink in. He's, and, and here's the thing. It's never a bad thing to talk to someone. It actually brings, we always say like conflict brings connection, especially if two people are doing it well and they can handle it. Um, some people are like, they become the victim of this, this conversation. They're like, it's, Mom, now you're blah, blah, blah. And then they throw it in your face and that's all unhealthy dynamics that we want to walk away from. Um, but <clears throat> when two people can go, oh, I'm so sorry that I made you feel that way. They can own it for themselves. They can just apologize or, you know, try to bring an understanding of what happened in the thing. But what, when you can tell that this is a trigger for you is when your emotion is higher than what it, it kind of should be for the situation, especially if there's like a lot of emotion that comes with it. Or if you start seeing patterns, patterns of similar situations that come up in your life, those are indicators that this is definitely a wound that you have. And um, I, I often, even if my emotion isn't very strong and, and there is a conflict, I just, we have just literally made it a, a part of how we handle those situations where like, hmm, okay, Lord, like, I don't even talk, I'm not even talk, I'm just going to go to you first. I'm going to ask you, like, what is going on inside of me that this is triggering this emotion, or this is making me feel upset, or whatever the case. Now, in marriage, I just want to say in marriage, <sighs> marriage is the place, for some reason, we get attracted to people who kind of almost carry the very thing that is like the, yeah, we'll push on your wounds. I don't know why that is, but I feel like part of it is that if we have humility and both are willing to grow, then you can come together and receive healing in the very area that can actually cause the most pain. And that is the goodness of Jesus Christ. That's where we get that from. The areas that we receive the most, could receive the most pain, could be the areas that we grow the most, that we receive healing the most. But it depends on how we approach it. If we approach it in the blame, and if we approach it in, you know, not being uh, able to own it, if we're doing all that, yeah, all that stuff, then we won't be able to get healing. But if we take it and we go, 
okay, God, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. Yeah, so an- another scripture around that is uh, Matthew 7, 3 through 6. Were any of you guys thinking about this? Play- yeah, yeah. So it's really clear. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? I mean, he's not saying this because people think to themselves, oh, I have a plank in my eye. People don't think I've got a plank. You don't think, oh, I've got a plank in my eye. That's not what you're thinking. You're thinking there's a little thing in you that needs to get taken (laughs) care of. You're not even noticing the plank, the thing in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite first take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see to clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Mm -hmm. And so we're always asking in humility, how am I contributing to this? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I just want to say with relationships, any kind of relationships, especially if both parties are willing to actually grow and change, and when they're not, all you can do is be healthy yourself in the relationship, and whether the person changes or not, that's not your problem. You know, that's not your responsibility. And the Boundaries book by Cloud and Townsend is so helpful, so helpful for that. Um, but learning to, to be healthy and honestly, when you go for growth and health in yourself and you don't get hooked into old patterns while you grow out of, because it takes, it takes a bit of practice and all that stuff, growing out of old patterns, if you, if you don't let the way that, like I'm saying, if, if you're in a relationship where one person is not willing to get healthy and the other person is, you just go for it. Grow as much as you can. Get get, you know, let the Lord heal you as much as you can and be healthy in the relationship and you being healthy and having good boundaries that will affect people around you. I've seen it over and over where people just, they go for it. And then the the people around them can either choose or not choose to grow. But so many times it actually influences people and they actually start changing around you. And it's so worth it. Yeah, And it's like in your story, Mm -hmm. God's like, Hey, that wouldn't have affected you if you were healed Mm -hmm. in your level, in your value, Mm -hmm. if you felt value, you would, he would have not texted you back. You would have thought, Oh, is he okay? There's something you wouldn't have been offended, hurt. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's what happens when we get healthy. People push on that thing, but there's nothing to push on. (laughs) It's like, you're like, you know, and, and we're going to accidentally say things and we're going to accidentally hurt each other. But if we're healthy, our, we're actually strong. And, and it, those things don't trigger us anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like for example, like with the, the wound on the arm that I was saying with a father, like if Seth triggers that thing and I'm like, wow, that really hurt. Um, you know, then it's like, okay, so that's telling me that I have, uh, an, an area here that still the Lord wants to heal in relationship with my father. And honestly, like father and mother wounds are the ones that will go the deepest and sometimes take the longest to heal. But Jesus can do it. He can do it in a moment or he can do it in a process. Um, but then the next time I go for some healing, the Lord does it. And then, um, you know, I go up to, to that same kind of situation will pop up again, bump up against that thing. And maybe this time it still hurts, but maybe it, it's not as bad or maybe it's a different angle of that wound or something. But then you just kind of keep letting the Lord do stuff. And I just want to say this. We let the Lord do it. Yeah, come on. Meaning... We, we go to get an HR appointment here at the church, healing and restoration appointment, or we go start seeing a counselor, or we, we let God show us some scriptures that will really help heal because scripture and the word of God is so powerful to heal. Um, or we, you know, fill in the blank on the ways that you can actually get healing and freedom. But the next time, you know, Seth and I have that same conflict, it's not nearly as bad. And that's the, the purpose is to let the situations in our lives be a signal to us about what God wants to do. The, the relationships in our lives are a gift to us if we see them that way, even when it's painful. And to stick it out. Don't let discomfort cause you to back away. 
push forward, you could be missing out on some sharpening that God wants to do. And I, I just want to say, just this is so true in the church world in general, is that a Christian will go into a church and they will kind of enjoy the new things about it and they will experience, you know, some cool stuff. And then as they get closer or they start kind of getting involved, you know, a, a situation comes up and then it's the blame. Everybody in here or whatever, you know, um, are, are the problem. This isn't a healthy church. I'm going to go. And maybe there's elements. Not every church is perfect. But then they go to another church and then they like the new things about it. They're excited. This is a fresh start. And then kind of a similar situation pops up or maybe a different one. And they're like, oh, this isn't a good church. And then they go to another church. And it's, it's like we could, and same thing for like maybe job situations. You go to different job situations and you experience kind of similar patterns. And it's like, this is a signal for God. This is an opportunity for healing. Every trigger is an opportunity for healing. It's not um, a reason to back off. And I would say that me staying in this church for from the age of 10 <laughs> until I was 37. And when we moved away, I stayed in difficult things and used them because we have such a culture here of inner healing um, and that I just grew up in, in knowing that God wanted to heal me. And so I let the Lord do so much in my heart instead of running. I leaned in and let God do things. And man, I changed. I changed so much. I had some people speak some truth into me that was also quite salty and maybe not what I wanted to hear. But man, it was so worth it. And I can't tell you how many times, like when you stay in relationships, even when they're painful, not abusive. We don't want to stay in abusive relationships. Hear me on that. But we want to let God do things inside of us and use the situations around us as a roadmap for our healing. Um, I want to say... So one example in our marriage, um, just for like the articulation of how this can work, is that uh, growing up, I had, many of you know my incredible dad, who's wonderful. What a great guy. Um, hardworking. Many of you know how hardworking he is. <laughs> and he worked a lot as, when I was a kid. And he loves projects, so he would have his job in the day, and then he would work a lot at night. And while that was so beautiful and I felt really provided for, um, I think there was a message that I received, whether my dad wanted to or not, he didn't, I know that, but um, that I wasn't valued. I, my love language is quality time. And so I really loved spending time. And um, I had this thing that, you know, maybe I wasn't valued with that time. And so, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and then... I grew up, I was homeschooled. Any other homeschoolers in, in here that were homeschooled? Yes. So one of the things about being homeschooled is that you're with your family all the time. And so, and your mom is telling you what to do and you're going to work on this and then you're going to work on this and then you're going to work on this. And then, and then she would say, and then tonight we're going to have family time. And I'm like, I've been with the family all day. Why, why do we have to have family? Why do we have to have family tonight? Yeah, and I'm an introvert, so geez, give me away. <laughs> give me some space. So I, you know, no fault to her. My mom is like amazing. Some of you have met my mom. She is a remarkable woman. But how I took that was I'm being controlled. That's how I took it. Like, go do this in school, now do this, now do this, and now be with the family. I was like, ah, my time is being controlled. It's out of my hands. So we got married, and like later in our years, we would have this tension that would come around Seth getting home from work. So I happened to also marry. My dad's very hardworking. I married a very hardworking man who's very focused on tasks. This is his, the joy of his life, besides me, of course. And, um, <laughs> and he had a really great job at Consumers Energy, and he had lots of hours he's working. So for me, it, I didn't even realize it, but it would be this tension around him getting home from work. And so I'd say, when are you going to get home from work? And he would say... 6.30, 6. And I'd be like, great, I'll have dinner ready. So I would try to make dinner, and Seth wouldn't get it home until 6.30, 7, 7.30. 7 7, <laughs> 7, 7. And I would just be so upset. I would be so upset. And it wasn't good that I was late. <laughs> like, let's just be honest. 
but it was pushing on her thing, right? Her her internal thing. And then for me, but I didn't know that. Right, I didn't, she didn't know, know that. We're learning. We were like, Jesus, help us. So then for me, she's like, Hey, are you gonna get? When are you coming home? Why aren't you home that? So what did I do? I was reverting back to what I felt like during homeschool years of being controlled. Like I was like, this woman is just controlling me. She will not. She's always on my time, always trying to get me to do things. But it was my, it was my wound that was actually causing the pain. Mm -hmm. So this is marriage. Welcome to marriage. God puts you two together. He has all mm -hmm. your issues mash up together. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can respond and go, okay, God, what do you want to do in me? How do you want to heal me? Yeah. So for both of us. Like this was definitely like a 50, 50 deal here, you know, like, but, but that's not how it seemed. Right. He's always late. If She's I was always on the controlling phone with, my time. I was on the phone with my sister. That's late again. Yeah. Can you believe it? I, I know he's, he just works all the time and then he gets home late. I mean, can't you see my side here? You, I mean, you, you can understand this is definitely Seth's fault. Obviously that blame so easy. How would I ever see that this had to do with my childhood unless I had the realization and the humility to go, what in me is contributing to this? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how it can work in relationships? So clear that this is Seth's issue. He is a workaholic. He cannot, he cannot just say no. Goodness, like, you know, just whatever the thing is, it's so clear, so obvious that this is all Seth's fault. But then when I go, what in me is contributing to it? I'm like, oh, I felt this way as a kid. Yeah, sometimes you can ask, where have I felt this feeling before? Where has that, where has that been? And you can even ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, where did this first come in? Where did that first show up? Yeah, or, you know, where in my childhood did I experience this thing? And so I'm like, yeah, I felt this way as a kid. This is how I felt. And in that regard, my judgment of my dad is being played out through Seth. And the Bible says, like, judge not lest you be judged with the measure that you judge, it will be measured back to you. And so you experience people in your life, or you do the same thing that your parent did. You know, maybe you didn't even mean to, or you know you did, but you reap what you sow in judgment with your, your family, and you we judge subconsciously all the time. And so Either you do the thing or someone close to you or in your life will do the thing that you judge for. And so that's what we we're experiencing in our marriage. And this is kind of, in a sense, a lighthearted example that caused a lot of tension. But when we worked through it, the situation and the circumstance didn't entirely change, but the tension completely went away. There was no issue after that anymore, which is amazing. But there's always more serious or like even more devastating wounds that were coming up against even traumatic types of things. And those can definitely be triggered by other people as well. So we want to, we want to just give the opportunity. Are, is there anyone here? And you, we're not going to ask you to come up or do anything like that. We're just, you're just going to spend some time with God, but is there anyone that's like, Hey, I've got current pain in relationship in my life somewhere. There's pain somewhere between me and someone else. There's a challenge. Okay. There's three of you. Very good. Well, you can all pretend then. No, <laughs> I know, I know that there's, I know that, I know that in every one of our lives, there's levels and areas that there is tension we're all and humans. challenge because we're all humans, yeah. but God wants to use those places of pain to heal, to bring healing. All right. So yeah, you want to come up and play. That's awesome. Justin is just unbelievable. <clears throat> So we're just going to go into a little ministry time with you and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So you can, uh, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to like find a more isolated or comfortable space in the room. You can do that. If you want to get away from your husband or wife <laughs> to, <laughs> to work through this. Um, no, it's real actually. So, um, all right. So let's just close our eyes. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you'll come into the room right now. God, I thank you for the truth that revival is sustained through healthy relationships, healthy family, unity, God. And all the way back where it, at the beginning with Adam and Eve, division was created and there was a cycle that brought division to happen. And God, 
more than anything else, we want to be healthy. We want to be in unity with our brothers and sisters, with our friends, with our, our, our spouses, God, in areas where it has been weak or, or we felt conflict. So this is the first question that I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit. And he's going to speak to you. What current pain, current conflict, current issue, Jesus, do you want me to, to, to talk to you about? What is, the, what is the current thing? And it might be, yeah, lots of times, like Sarah said, it's stuff that brings us big emotion. Or we've seen it repeated over and over and over and over in our relationships. Or just irritation. So Holy Spirit, what, what pain, what conflict, what irritation do you want to speak to me about today? And if there's too many to pick, <laughs> just allow the Holy Spirit to highlight one to you. So when you've got that, the next question is, like, what is the wound in me that this thing is rubbing up against? What is the wound in me? Where did this come from in me? So this is the hard step of going, I see that 99% of this problem is the other person, but God, what in me is contributing to this? Okay, let's, let's ask the Holy Spirit this question. Where did that wound first come from? Where did that wound first show up? Where did that feeling that I felt first show up? How did I get, get this wound originally? And again, like in both of our parents' situation, it might not have been something that they did intentionally but it caused a wound in us. It could have been something that was intentional. Like it could have been a, a not good situation, like Sarah talked about earlier, abuse or something like that. It could have been that as well. God, where did this first come into my life? Where, is this, where did this wound originate?
And um, just as you consider what that um, pain was or where that wound came from, what's really um, helpful is actually to acknowledge it, to let your heart, let your heart actually feel some of the things that you felt from that situation. And maybe the current situation is bringing up some of those emotions. And um, it's actually good to acknowledge it, to feel some of those feelings and give them a little bit of space. It could be sadness, it could be anger, it could be um, frustration or disappointment. Let yourself feel some of those emotions for a few minutes. Give your heart the space to feel those things. Just as you're letting your heart feel some of those emotions, um, I just want to acknowledge the Holy Spirit in the room who is the great counselor and also the great comforter. Second Corinthians says that he's the God of all comfort. Hey. And um, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And as we let ourselves feel some of those emotions from those wounds, the Lord loves to come and comfort. We should not go through pain, especially as much pain as we do in this life, without also out not receiving comfort. We need the comforter. And so let's let the Holy Spirit come and comfort about that wound or that difficult situation. And you can even ask the Lord to show you how he's comforting you. Thank you, Lord, for your love that loves to come and hey, bring comfort, bring a sense of being surrounded in love, a sense of security and peace right where we had pain. One powerful thing to do is to forgive the people that have hurt us. Whether it's the person who's causing the trigger that's in the current circumstance, or if it's the people or person, or maybe it's yourself. Hey, it's so powerful to forgive yourself. And if you'd like to, you can 
um, just in your heart or mind or under your breath, just speak forgiveness. Say, I forgive so-and-so for, or I forgive myself for. And forgiveness is not saying that what the person did was okay. Actually, forgiveness is acknowledging the pain and then releasing them from that debt that they owe you for the pain that was caused. And um, I think the last thing that we'll do is just ask God his perspective or truth, either regarding the current situation or the wound from earlier. What does he want to say? What truth does he want to give you? What words of comfort does he want to tell you? Father is speaking. He's just speaking right now. He's speaking truth. He's speaking wisdom. He's speaking words of healing, of comfort. He was there in those painful places. He felt even the pain with you. The Bible says that Jesus was acquainted with all of our suffering. He knew the depth of the pain, and he knew how that would affect us, and yet he made a way to heal us. Yeah, and if you can just imagine like a container inside of you that is meant for comfort, let's just let God fill your internal soul container with comfort right now. I just feel like he wants to fill up this whole room with comfort. Yeah, let's go. God, we just thank you, thank you, thank you for your comfort in this place. Lord, I pray that we'd all just soak it in, fill us up with comfort, God. And would you show us what that looks like? Would you show us what it feels like? Thank you, God. And we just say more and more of that as we go on. Um, thank you for your comfort that is so, so tangible and so healing and so helpful. And um, I kind of want to just end tonight by just saying a prayer over all of us. I know that for me, I think I used to feel like God was a bit distant in my healing journey and um, I, that's changed and I'm just so thankful but I feel oftentimes like just a little kid <laughs> whenever I have something that comes up that I'm like oh I see that thing inside of me or I keep 
experiencing these interesting situations in my life and I don't know how to fix it, but God, you do. I feel like a little kid, like, God, I need your help. <laughs> Daddy, I need your help. <laughs> Would you just come and heal my heart? Would you make me so full of freedom and love? And would you make me healthy in my relationships, Lord? And would you eliminate all shame that I would have a full, true identity, full of honor of who you made me to be? Lord, that I'd be so full of love that there would be no fear, that I would be so full of freedom that there would be no control, that I would be so able to walk in a victorious mindset that I am not a victim, that I own my own situation instead of put blame on others, and that I have unity in my connections with you, Lord, and with other people. Lord, we just come like little children and say, do it inside of us, God. Yes, God, do it. Do it inside of us, God. You can have your way in me. I just open myself up to you healing my heart. Yes, God. And in Jesus' name, I just speak hope to every relationship right now. Thank hey, you, God. I just speak hope to every marriage right now in Jesus' Thank name. God. I speak yes. hope to every like difficult circumstance in connection and in families, maybe where there's just been lots of dysfunction. Lord, we just thank you, God. We just say hope, 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 hope. Rise up in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Hope rise up in the name of Jesus because you are the one that we hope in. Yes. It is you doing it, God. And we just surrender to your doing it inside of us, you growing us into health. Thank you, God. And I just thank you in Jesus' name for your blood that flows through family lines. Yes. Lord, that your, your blood, your glory flows through family lines and totally changes situations. And I see people in this room being giant slayers where there are generational giants and you are going at them. And I just see you being like David and just taking that stone and just going for it, slinging it at, at Goliath, the Goliath of fear or the Goliath of control or the Goliath of shame that are in family lines. I just see you hurling those things and the giants falling, the giants falling because of the power of the Lord. And what David said when he went after Goliath was he was like, you know, I come to you, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and I will take your head from you this day. I mean, he just knows it's the power of God that does it. It's the power of God that he had this tiny little stone. That's it. Like it wasn't this massive, masterly like tool or, you know, massive weapon. It was like a little stone. It's just what he had. And the Lord loves to use what you have. And he just uses that to fling it at giants and they fall. That is what the Lord does. He is the one who defeats generational giants. And we just thank you that you're doing it in these families in Jesus' name. They will no longer have their place in these family lines in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. And we just declare along with healthy relationships, healthy bodies, and we just speak health to bodies, even soul issues that have been linked to, to sicknesses and diseases. We just say, be healed in Jesus' name, body, soul, and spirit. Sozo healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Yeah, we just bless everybody as they go this weekend. We bless everyone as they go. And we just thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done. Bill and Mary Lee. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> What a significant teaching. That is going to help us so much in our lives, isn't it? I think I want to just take a few minutes and just process together. I think something that really struck me was how when you're no longer looking at a situation as a victim, there, you know, where your focus is like, they're doing this thing and it's hurting me and I'm so hurt by that. As soon as you forgive and God shows you, all of a sudden, you're freed up to, like, care about that person. Oh, maybe there's a reason, like how you said, your, was it your coworker who didn't respond to your text? As soon as God healed you, you were like, oh, he's probably just really busy. Oh, you know, I wonder how that person's doing. You know, maybe there's something going on in them. Maybe I'll pray for them. Maybe I'll actually reach out to them. Like, how are you doing, you know? Is everything okay? Like, it's a total, 
totally a shift. Does anybody else have anything that just kind of a revelation that hit them from this talk that they want to just share? Anybody? But we're going to be able to use this, aren't we, in our lives? So good. All right. Well? Well, this weekend has been wonderful. We got a lot of hope. There were people's bodies were healed over the course of this weekend. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> I see a fist bumping back there. Yeah, and more to come, right? Those Some healings you look back and go, oh my gosh, that got better. And you find them later. So we're looking for those to come. We're going to sort of, as we go forward as New Day Community Church from here forward, we're going to um, steward the gift God has given us by continuing to share the testimonies of what he did during the weekend and coming out of the weekend. And um, the physical healings are amazing, but also what happened tonight is really really a key part of what it means to be a strong, healthy church that's following Jesus. Because we're like a family, and we're bumping into each other's woundedness. Sometimes we're sharper with one another than we should be, and things happen, and there's conflict and confrontation, and there's celebration. There's all the things that happen in a family, and like we're just going for what's on the slide to be healthy people to be a healthy church, to follow Jesus, to help each other along that journey. And so we're going to carry this with us. We have for a long time. We're just going to continue in it. <laughs> so it's been so good. If you're thankful for Seth and Sarah and the team coming, we just give them a, a big hand? <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much. So we're going to wrap up for the night. We're going to wrap up for the weekend. If you want to thank them financially, you can stop at the giving station on the way out, and we'll send that along with them on their way home to South Carolina. Um, otherwise, stand up if you're able, feeling it. Stand up. And uh, a one-sentence prayer to wrap it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. You're dismissed.